In previous lessons, I've been kind of building us up to this really fancy definition that the National Institute of Standards and Technology provides for cloud computing. When we look at how they define it, we can see that we really did need a little bit of background information in order to process what they're talking about. And let's face it, when it comes to defining things, that's exactly what these standards organizations like NIST were created for. Over the next couple of lessons, we're going to be digging into the five essential characteristics, the three service models, and the four deployment models of cloud computing. As we dig into these five characteristics of cloud computing, keep in mind the three core technologies I talked about in previous lessons, virtualization, automation, and wide area networking. All of these traits come directly from those technologies. Okay, so the first one we'll put up here is broad network access. And it's definitely important to note that they said broad here and not just internet based, because while the internet is certainly a broad network, it is not the only network that exists out there. So the World Wide Web counts, and if there are enterprise networks where businesses have built their own environments and run their own networks, attaching to those resources over that internal network counts as using cloud services as well. The whole point is that we're using network attached resources. It doesn't really matter where the network is. That being said, one of the most important decisions that many organizations have to consider is whether to use enterprise networks or to use resources that live on the internet. The next one on here is I think probably one of the most popular features and that is self-serviceability. This is where a service provider or an administrator could create a menu with a list of products and services available Users can then select from those products and have them automatically create and built for them in the background without any direct interaction from the service provider or the admin. It's like being able to buy a car without having to go onto the dealership lot and actually talk to a salesperson. Instead, you can just choose an option directly out of the menu and voila, the cloud service provider creates that for you on demand. For many businesses, this means that the long provisioning timelines that used to take them anywhere from weeks to possibly even months to buy and provision servers and hardware can now be done in just a matter of minutes without even having to pick up the phone and talk to anybody. And even better, in the background, the cloud service providers have to deal with all of that capacity and infrastructure management problem, something that if I owned all of the systems, I would have to take care of myself. Now, if you're going to let people do self-service administration, then the third one on here kind of becomes a necessary evil that goes along with it, and that is measured service. And there's really two different sides to this. If we're letting people do self-service and they can use menus to create things like virtual machines, then in many situations, we're going to need to know how long those virtual machines run for. And if you're working with a cloud service provider, they're going to want to know how much to charge you for the amount of time that your machine ran. Or perhaps you're using a piece of software like an app that you bought in one of the mobile device stores. There is still a cost associated with that. The second part of the measured service piece has to do with using things in more of a utility pricing model. Kind of like the way that we pay for electric or water. We only have to pay for the cost of things while they're actually running. When the virtual machine gets terminated or we stop using the app, we don't have to pay for it anymore. This is uniquely different from what a lot of traditional businesses do where they had to buy software and they just kind of owned it indefinitely for the rest of their life. Now we can own things for just the amount of time that we need to use them for. This is like renting an apartment instead of buying a home or renting a car for a weekend rather than driving your own car. The fourth trait we talk about is shared resources. And this is something that really does affect the value proposition that cloud computing presents. Just like when you rent an apartment or if you rent a car, part of the value there is that you don't have to own it. Someone else is allowing you to use it for a certain amount of time. In that same way, cloud service providers can share the resources that they have available, like web servers and networks, and allow different customers to work together and use those same environments as they need to. One day, A and B might be using these servers, and then on another day, C might be using this server and B and A might be over on these servers here. Some cloud service vendors will also offer the ability to use quote unquote private servers, but keep in mind that anything that's private like this costs additionally because the service provider is not able to share it with other customers anymore. Some of you might notice too that sharing resources like this could present a bit of a security concern, and that's absolutely one of the reasons why many organizations will choose to run their own clouds inside of their organization. And in a scenario like that, a, B, and C then could become portions of the business that are using it rather than thinking of them as uh, public customers that are sharing the resources. 
And the last trait on here is going to be particularly of interest to Tiggers because Tiggers are wonderful things and they're made out of springs. A cloud computing service should also be elastic and scalable. The way that I like to describe this one is kind of funny. Imagine that a web server is sitting there selling tickets at a movie theater. Currently, it's Friday night and it's not quite 5 o'clock yet, and so there's just the one person on hand to sell tickets. A line is starting to build up because people are getting off work and they're coming out to watch movies. The problem is the next person coming along to help out sell tickets, they're not there for another 10 more minutes. Cloud services like websites and mobile applications can run into the same sorts of problems. An overwhelming amount of people who need to buy tickets or use the application and not enough servers to respond. So a cloud computing service should be able to open new additional windows by launching additional web servers in response to the growing number of people that are waiting to buy tickets. Modern web applications can now scale to handle demand. And so as more customers show up, we have more people there to sell tickets. Similarly, our web applications and our websites can keep running. Now the final thing to remember here is that currently the movie theater is now paying for three different people to sell tickets. And so as the number of people who need to buy tickets begins to drop, or the number of users of the application or the website begin to drop, the movie theater needs to get rid of some of their ticket sellers, and in the same way, cloud computing services can scale back down. And this is really powerful because it frees us up for having to pay for those resources anymore. We can go back to just the one ticket seller or just the one web server during times of low demand. And so now we've got a pretty well-defined checklist of what a service should do in order to consider it a cloud computing service. Are people able to access resources over a network? That could be the internet or it could be an internal network. Is there a menu and self-service model that allows people to do this without necessarily having to interact directly with an administrator or with the service provider? After that, there should be detailed measurements about how much the service has been used. This may drive the cost of using the services. The resources that you should be working with should be shared amongst a number of different business units, or with internet-based cloud service providers, it might be shared with other customers. Not only is this a key characteristic, but it is also one of the big things that helps drive the value proposition. The more sharing of resources we do, the more cost savings that we're able to create. And that brings us down to the last part, elasticity, which says that we should be able to grow and shrink the service depending on the types of demands that it's seeing. This should drive further savings by allowing us to pay for the resources we need only when we're using them. In closing, thanks to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we now have a clear definition of what a service should do or the traits that a service should have to be considered a cloud computing service. We also pointed out very importantly that services don't have to be driven on the internet in order to be considered a cloud service. In future lessons, we'll be talking about that topic a lot more as we look at cloud deployment models and cloud service models. Don't miss it. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.